It's the week of August 6, 2018, and you're listening to the Missouri Growing Point Agronomy Podcast. I'm your co-host, Pioneer Field Agronomist Jamie Farmer, and with me as always is my counterpart to the east, Nick Monning. This week's episode, we talk about the late season disease observations in corn and soybean. So welcome back listeners and welcome back Nick. Uh, Nick, if we had to continue to keep picking the word for 2018, what would that be? It continues to be variability, Jamie. We're going to see a lot of variability, obviously field to field, but even within the field, we're going to see huge variability and even plant to plant, we're going to see variability. Yeah, that's that's definitely true. I know we keep using that word in these podcasts and as we visit you out there in the field, but definitely going to be the key word for the 2018 growing season. Some very colorful yield maps out there. Speaking of yield map, just a quick look here at our GDU accumulation as we sit today. If we look at central Missouri, April 17th planted corn, we're at 2,607 GDUs, which puts us past the required GDUs for some of our hybrids that would be in the 2,470 to 2,600 range. So we have a lot of stuff that is hit black layer is getting ready to hit black layer here in Missouri. So if we think about the dry down period, there's a lot of us that are going to be out there shelling corn here at the end of this month and definitely in the first part of September. So we got a lot going on there with corn here in a hurry uh, this year, Nick. So what are some of the things just thinking about that corn plant that we need to keep an eye on out there before we roll into harvest here? Yeah, Jamie. So you talked about giving us the subject of late season disease. And so one thing we have seen come flushing in would be gray leaf spot. Um, in our geography, we haven't seen much as far as the southern rust. It's kind of stayed south of us. The northern we talked about there right around the 1st of July. You know, obviously we had too much heat, too much drought for that. But gray, had enough foggy mornings lately, just enough rainfall in a few areas to kick some gray up late. Probably late enough, not going to cause much in terms of yield loss at all. But it probably on susceptible hybrids with the way it's starting to get loaded up here late, it probably will rob some stock quality out of those plants. So definitely be something just to be mindful of where those susceptible hybrids are at and potentially what that gray looks like now for developing a harvest schedule. Good point there, Nick, with the gray leaf spot. Definitely something that we're going to, again, see a lot of this year. Something else I've noticed out there where I've been out in the field, I'm peeling back some of these husks, Nick, and some of the things I'm seeing. I've got some white molds in there. I've got some green, I'm seeing some salmon colored stuff. So if we just talk a little bit on ear molds there and some of the different key ear molds that we're seeing out there in the field, that'd be probably something else to keep a lookout for these growers. Yeah, that's a great point, Jamie. That's one thing that we are starting to see ear molds showing up. There's different types of ear molds. Probably the easiest way to divide those would be those that cause mycotoxins versus those that don't cause mycotoxins. So those mycotoxins can cause some huge discounts at the elevator, even on sellable grain. Um, some of the ones that don't cause mycotoxins can also lead some discounts, but just in terms of damaged kernels. So important just to remember that difference. But when it comes to the major ones we're seeing out there, Diplodia is one. That's one that typically starts at the base of the ear. It mummifies that ear. It turns that husk, makes it really tight against that ear, so it's really hard to, to pull off. But this one does not cause any mycotoxins. We tend to see it common in Missouri most years. One thing we tend not to think about, though, is in a drought condition having diplodia. But we did have that that cool down there the end of June with a little bit of moisture. And that's probably what led to some of this infection of diplodia. Fusarium is one that we're starting to see a lot of right now, too. That one can infect anywhere on the ear. It's common to see when we have stress around silking. So something like this year, perfect ear for it. It can cause kind of that white to salmony, cottony, fungal growth between the kernels, and it can even cause those infected kernels to be kind of brown or starbursted. It does cause a mycotoxin, so certain places it can lead to a, a discount at the elevator. Probably the other one to think about would be aspergillus. This one tends to start on the ear tip, kind of turns that green powdery moldy, moldy look on the on the end impacts those damaged kernels so where we tend to have corn earworm feeding is where we can kind of see that move in on those damaged kernels it's most common in years with high heat and high drought conditions just like this year jamie it does produce some mycotoxins probably the number one we think about with mycotoxins leading to heavy discounts or even unsellable grain in places and then just a couple other non-common ones that we tend to see a lot this year would be Penicillium, which looks very similar to aspergillus, 
it can produce some mycotoxins and then trichoderma, which tends to kind of, you know, if we talk about diplodia mummifying that ear white, it tends to maybe mummify it a little bit green, green between all the infected kernels, but no mycotoxins there. So a lot of things just to think about in terms of the ear molds that we are seeing right now. Good point and something to keep in mind there, Nick, you know, so if we are seeing ear molds out there in that grain, what are some of the things that these growers might want to consider when it comes time to harvest those corn fields that, that might have some infection there in the ear? Yeah, Jamie, that's a good question. So one thing to think about is if you think you're seeing a pretty significant amount in the field, obviously you you want to contact your crop insurance agent because that could lead to some discounts at the elevator. The other thing you probably want to do is, is harvest that stuff as quickly as possible and then dry it down. We tend to say down to 14% as quickly as possible just to stop that mold growth as quick as we can. Yeah, and then something else, I guess, just to add in there on that is, is also keep in mind that you want to try to keep some of that grain segregated uh, from your grain that may not have the infection. Um, good points on that. So, Jamie, if one other thing we were talking a little bit about, gray leaf spot, foliar disease on corn, what about on soybeans? We're starting to see these little dots starting to show up on the soybean leaves. Is there something starting to happen there? Yeah, Nick, so that's a good question, something that we're seeing on soybeans, frog eye leaf spots showing up across Missouri. Lesions on the leaves start out as dark brown spots with kind of a darker brown or a reddish tinted ring around those spots that could be spots or irregular lesions. See a pod and stem infection as well with that. Where there's severe leaf blighting on susceptible varieties, you may approach significant yield losses, some up to 30%. We have a moderate resistant to resistant varieties. You tend to show a low impact on your yield. So something that we're seeing out there, in many cases, a foliar fungicide at R3 will help definitely take care of that spread and uh, increase in severity of frog eye leaf spot. We have seen some severe levels in past years where we get half that leaf area affected, and we can see some improvement with apps as late as R5. So we think about soybeans where they're at right now. There's still quite a bit of potential. Obviously, we'll need some rains here this month um, in the first part of September to really set the yield for a lot of those. But most of them are moving out of R4, which is that reproductive stage where we have a full flat pod in the top four nodes, and moving into R5. Most of them are, are already in R5, which is the beginning of that seed inside the pod, so beginning of pod fill. And so that's why we're seeing and concerned about a lot of these diseases showing up right now. With frog eye, something to keep an eye out on. Um, anything else there with your experience, Nick, that you may add on frog eye? Only thing I would say is just be mindful of what where the susceptible varieties are at for frog eye because there's a large difference varietal. And we have seen in the past where some really weak varieties get hit pretty hard late. And just like you mentioned, you can see some advantage to a fungicide late with the right situation. Yep, excellent point. Other thing, Jamie, some folks may be starting to notice some of those purple, leathery type leaves going on in the soybean canopy. What can you tell us about those? Yeah, so we think about a purple or a leathery appearance to a leaf usually leads me down the road of Cercospora leaf blight, uh, also known as uh, purple seed stain of soybeans. That's a disease, fungal disease, that shows up in humid, warm temperatures uh, can really ramp up as you move 80 degrees and above. And so we usually see this really show up in August during pod filling. But obviously, as we've mentioned in previous episodes, we're quite a bit farther ahead of normal track as far as growth stages and GDUs go for both crops this year. And so some of the stuff that we tend to see in August, we're seeing at the end of the July. And so that's showing up in places. Those leaves that are predominantly in the upper canopy or, or collect more direct sunlight, will get that bronze to a reddish brown purple tint and kind of a leathery appearance. Cercospora is a disease, fungal disease that survives in crop residue. So rotation is an important way to break kind of that inoculum build in the soil. And then also fungicide seed treatment can help avoid some of the early infection that you can get from that and some of the seedling blight effect that you can get from Cercospora. And then also a foliar fungicide can give fair control. Again, like we mentioned in previous episodes, utilizing an R3 application timing for that. Something to be concerned about in Missouri, sometimes it can be confused for potassium deficiency. We tend to get a yellow phase to Cercospora that uh, will show up on the upper canopy and look similar to potassium deficiency. But when you move out there in that field, you'll, you'll start to notice that brown leathery appearance out there on those leaves. So 
Keep that in mind. There's not a great source of resistance in uh, varieties as far as that goes, but you know something that we tend to see a little bit more of here in Missouri over the past few years. One more, Jamie. People tend not to think about disease in soybeans in a drought year. We tend to think about fungal growth in a wet, humid year, but what's something we might see because of this drought? Yeah, one of the probably more popular phone calls here and, and field visits the last week and a half to two weeks has been charcoal rot in soybeans, also known as summer wilt or dry weather wilt. So, you know, folks driving along, looking out across those fields, they'll see those areas, the driest areas of their field are usually the first ones to show that charcoal rot. One way to really kind of go out there and tell for as far as an ID goes for that disease is to go out there and and pull those plants up and use your pocket knife and scrape off that outer lower stem tissue to see if it reveals any black kind of dusty microsclerotia, which is basically a word used to describe a fungal body uh, that is protruding out of those cells there and uh, looks kind of like black dots on the lower part of the stem under that outer tissue. Typically with charcoal rot, you'll get the wilt phase. Once those plants reach a permanent wilting point, they can die prematurely. And so as the disease kind of progresses on and we tend to stay hotter and drier, uh, you'll see that that spread and the severity increase as far as charcoal rot goes. Unfortunately, the infection with this disease occurs early in the spring when the soil is moist. So there's really not a lot you can do about it at this stage. But like Nick mentioned, you know, with other diseases such as frog eye, it's important to go out there and really keep note of which varieties are more susceptible for charcoal rot versus others. There are some pretty good swings and varietal differences with that. and something to keep in mind as well. Yeah, Jamie. So I appreciate you going through that. Talked a little bit about frog eye and the impacts we can see late. Definitely differences in varieties. Talked about Cercospora leaf blight. Some of those purple leathery leaves can even get a yellow blighting phase in Missouri. And then we talked about charcoal rot. One thing I will mention with charcoal rot, just to be mindful of, Jamie talked about the importance of identifying it or taking note of it now, is just be aware that we always talk about the importance of early soybean harvest just to capture as much yield as but possible but with soybean stress with charcoal rot or those pods being stressed all through this drought it, they are definitely going to be more prone to shattering so more prone to loss so you'll definitely want to get on those as quickly as you can jamie last thing i was going to ask you is what is something to be thinking about over the coming weeks yeah something to uh, keep in mind is obviously we fit black layer with corn so we're going to be getting to harvest uh quicker than we typically do and so with that comes some of the other fall activities that we do we've got a lot of folks that are considering using cover crops or establishing some cover crops this fall and so we want to keep in mind some of the carryover issues that we could see from some of the residual herbicides that we use in our corn and soybeans this summer and so that's something that we'll talk about next time uh, just kind of go into some of the scenarios where you may need to be a little bit more concerned trying to establish certain types of cover crop following specific residuals so with that we thank you for your time we thank you for listening Nick, if folks can't find us in the field, uh, it's always important to know where to find us. So where can they look for us? They can find our podcast at podcast.pioneer.com. And they can find me on Twitter at Nick Monning. And they can find me at the Jamie Farmer. Obviously, you can also reach out to your Pioneer sales professional and get signed up for Walking Your Fields newsletters and other timely agronomic info delivered to your inbox. And then also reach out to them and the rest of your Pioneer team if you're seeing some things in the field or you've got some questions. Again, thank you for your time. We thank you for your business, and we look forward to visiting with you again.